call him Mr. Zoo. <laughs> he drives a great big car, smokes a big cigar. He looks like a king and he acts like a star. When we see him drive by, he goes doo doo. We all shout, hey, Mr. Zoo. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Blu-ray Boutique. I'm your co-host, Tim Rosenberger. And I'm your co-host, Rosalie Lewis. And today we're going to be doing something kind of special. Uh, we're going to be actually taking a step out of the boutique, as it, w- as it would. And we're going to be talking about four films of Brendan Fraser. Now, why are we taking a step out of the boutique for that? Well, that's because we, Rosalie and I wanted to do an episode, at least one episode, on Brendan Fraser. But uh, none of his films that I am aware of, anyway, um, have been released by any sort of boutique label. In order to give us an excuse to do this, we're going to actually be talking about films that are not about a boutique label today. This is a kind of type of episode we'll probably do every now and then. Don't expect it very much. It will probably at most be once a year, if that. But it will be something we'll do every now and then just so we can talk about films that we wouldn't otherwise be able to talk about. So today we're going to be talking about Brendan Fraser movies. There was a lot to choose from. Uh, a lot of different ways we could have approached this. I think we kind of basically settled on a bunch of early for the most part, early films that he did. And we'll be talking about Encino Man from 1992, Airheads from 1994, Still Breathing from 1997, and Blast from the Past from 98 or 99. I've seen both dates, but I believe 99 is the more correct uh, release date. But, uh, Rosalie, do you remember the first time you were exposed to Brendan Fraser? I'm thinking back because it's hard for me to remember what order I would have seen these movies in. I didn't see them chronologically, but I do think one of the very first ones that made an impression on me had to have been Blast from the Past because I do think I saw that in the very early 2000s. It came out in 99, as you mentioned. So that was definitely one that made an impression. And then I do remember seeing the first Mummy movie in theaters and thinking that was just a real blast. And then going back and watching Encino Man, which, you know, we're going to talk about Monkey Bone, which is so weird, but like Uh. still super fun. And, you know, he just would pop up in these unexpected ways. And he seems like one of those actors that, you know, he was very versatile, but also he just has this charm about him as a person that I think goes a long ways towards making people want to seek out his movies. And I've been really encouraged in the last year or so to hear about, you know, the renaissance, right, that Mm -hmm. supposedly is coming because he was out of the spotlight for a while, and we may talk a little bit about that and about why, but it's it's nice to hear his name being mentioned again in such a positive light because I was always a big fan of his, and, you know, even though I can't say I've seen every one of his movies, the ones that I have seen I tend to really like, and even if the movie itself isn't that strong, he's usually a thing to like about it if that makes sense Mm -hmm. no he's always i don't remember exactly when i got first introduced it was probably one of the mummy movies though Mm -hmm. i'm not it's it's hard to say though because i probably saw bits and pieces of the mummy movies and then i probably saw he has a very small supporting part where he doesn't even say very much in the live action rocky and bullwinkle movie i probably saw a bit of him in that and then at one point, I did probably before I saw any of all of any of the Mummy movies, I did see him in one uh, movie I know you were really fond of, um, Bedazzled. Oh yeah. I saw that, and then eventually I saw the Mummy movies. Saw actually the second one first, oddly enough, and the first one. I actually saw the third one when that what came out in theaters. Oh, George's Jungle might have been an early one too. So it's kind of hard, like you, it's kind of hard to know when exactly it was. But so some of the earlier earliest films of his I saw, and I just liked him. There was just something I think there's just something innately likable about him and he's one of those guys who is kind of like in terms of an actor he's kind of like a Humphrey Bogart or like a Patrick Walburton or something in, in, in that he on the surface it would look like he has a very limited range and there's only kind of a specific type or types of characters he can do but I think with and he can, he can he's more versatile one, one I think he's more versatile than I think some people will give him credit for but then two I think within his kind of range of stuff he can do quite a lot of different things he can modify that type of character in quotes that he does and make it do a lot of different versatile things with it um, again like a Patrick Walburton or whatever who does do kind of a very specific type of thing but it can very and very subtle ways to the point where it can do a wide variety of characters so Brendan Fraser he's not a like a Dustin Hoffman, Daniel Day-Lewis 
transformation-y type actor specifically, though he has changed his look a bit in some of his films. But he is still, nonetheless, I think, uh, like I said, a versatile actor and just a very charming actor, even when he's not playing a charming guy, who you just you just like to see on the screen. And I am happy that he's starting to do more stuff again, like June Patrol. He's doing or had, did just did a Scorsese movie, so I'm glad that he's starting to come back. Yeah, I really think he has this unique quality that no matter what kind of role he's playing, he brings a certain, I don't know, naivety is not the right word. I feel like it's almost like a a winsomeness to it where he may even not be playing like one of these guys that is, you know, more babe in the woods, but he just has a certain quality that is like he's seeing the world for the first time. And I find that yeah. very appealing. Exactly. He has a sort of childlikeness to him. He's yeah. just everything's kind of like you said kind of just new and wondrous and he just he seems like i think as a person and you can see i think a lot in a lot of his parts too again even the ones that don't emphasize this terribly much if at all that i think he as a person often as an actor in his parts has a certain love for life and a certain just love for he he seems and obviously i don't know him but he seems like the type of person who just kind of enjoys the little things and Mm -hmm. enjoys just the little bits of magic you can get in life and again I think that translates to his acting and uh, how much audiences enjoy him. Yeah and he just never seems like he takes himself overly seriously there are actors out there who started out in a more comedic vein like he did and then kind of transitioned into that you know hunt for red Oscar Tober kind <laughs> of deal and he, I don't feel like he ever did that. Like, he did have some serious roles, you know, like in Gods and Monsters and mm-hmm. things like that. And maybe Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be that for him. I don't know, because obviously none of us have seen it. But it just seems like he's a humble guy who's just out there working and, you know, choosing things that look interesting. And there's something about that that I really respect. Yeah, he has, I think he has a reputation of being just a very kind of humble, kind of like a Keanu Reeves who you just, yes. t- you know, people talked about him. And he's just a genuinely good person, like, mm-hmm. you know, um, the type of people most of us wish we were. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, so a, bad, a good person who had a lot of bad luck in the 2000s, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely, you know, a well-deserved comeback, I would say. And I think, you know, we, we saw the video go around last year that mm-hmm. was on TikTok, I believe, of you know him getting emotional when he found out how much fans were rooting for him and you know how much he'd become kind of a meme on the internet of people just really loving him and you hate to see bad things happen to a seemingly really good person and it just feels like now more than ever it's his time so Mm -hmm. you know hopefully he'll be able to make that comeback and really get the love that he deserves and and the appreciation he deserves but you know we're here to appreciate his his older movies and also hope that He's got new ones that are that are going to be great um, coming out very soon. Okay, so the first movie we're going to be talking about is Encino Man, again from 1992. It is a comedy. It is not, it wasn't his first movie, but it was his first one with the leading part and with any really sort of significant part, I believe. He had done two TV movies before that in 1991, and also in 1991 he did a movie called Dogfight, where he played, I'm assuming a small part because his name on, his character name on IMDb is Sailor Number One. Uh, I'm sorry, three TV movies. And uh, this is his first big movie it was kind of a big break, big break for him and uh the plot of this one is in california i believe a senior in high school played by sean astin and his his best friend played by Polly shore sean astin's character really wants to become popular 
and stuff and uh, kind of win the affections of a girl named Robin, played by Megan Ward. I want to look back on my high school career and think that I started slowly, but I finished strong. You know? I mean, high school's almost over, and I don't have anything to show for it. I know, me neither. Dude, you should be stoked, though, buddy, because you got through the last four years without the full-on melon tweak. It's not enough. I mean, I want my own page in the yearbook. Jump off the gym, splatter on the street, and go for the cup. It's not funny. I'm not going down as this geek kid from Encino. When I finish this pool, I'm going to have the killer party after the prom. Uh, um, I'm going to be the prom king, and I'm going to graduate a legend. Uh, so he's digging a big hole in the ground. While digging this hole, him and his friend, Pedro Holy Shore, discover a big, big, huge block of ice. And they quickly find out that there's a man inside. <laughs> and it's a caveman. So they take him to this garage because his mother and his parents well his father was at home and his mother is just on the phone and oblivious take him to this shed in their backyard that i guess nobody goes into and uh put the block of ice some sort of sort of contraption and put heaters in there to help thaw it out with the grand plan of becoming rich and famous and popular with this great discovery that later sean astin decide after coming up with this plan says no we can't actually show the people this this discovery but my plan will work somehow it will. So eventually, uh, the ice completely thaws, and they discover this caveman uh, having uh, kind of run amok in Sean Astin's house, and they clean him up and have the bright idea to take him to high school as a student with funny hair. And then hijinks ensue with a bully, played by Michael DeLuise, who is actually Dom DeLuise's son, and who is with Robin, the girl that Sean Astin's character Dave wants to be with. And that's pretty much it. There is not much of a plot for this movie. Uh, things just sort of happen in it, and then eventually the credits roll and it's over. So it's more just about funny things happening and kind of vignettes and all that sort of stuff. So, like I said, this was hit with Sean, uh, Sean Astin's. It was uh, Brendan Fraser's kind of breakthrough part, and the part originally of the caveman character who they named Link was originally, I guess, intended for Polly Shore, but they decided to give to make Polly Shore best friend of Sean Astin's character because Polly Shore had a very certain way of speaking in mm -hmm. the 90s and they wanted to capitalize on that and since the caveman character Link was not going to talk very much they let him apparently just let him be in scenes in ad lib though there were some characters without Sean Astin's character in them so I don't know how that worked but anyway it's kind of amazing in a way I think it kind of maybe shows the impact a physical mostly physical performance can have on an audience that this was Brendan Fraser's breakthrough role and again he says almost nothing in the movie he says very he has very little lines it's mostly just doing funny things physical acting facial stuff some funny dances and all that stuff so in a way it is kind of amazing that he made such a big impact with this and was able to kind of launch a career out of this part yeah I remember seeing this just before college I would say and perfect time to see it I remember watching it on VHS <laughs> It was probably one of those late night, you know, watch with pizza and, you know, drink as much caffeinated beverages as possible <laughs> situations. And, you know, it's a very silly but very fun movie. Just <laughs> the fact that, like, they put this big, you know, block of ice in the garage, which naturally it would have melted on its own anyways. But then they have, like, space heaters blowing at it and they come back from school. And, of course, there's a big puddle on the floor and they're like, he melted. <laughs> It's just so dumb, but, like, you have to love it. Polly Shore, <laughs> as the weasel, you know, character that he kind of played, with, where he makes these weird little mouth noises. He's, and he's called Stony. Stony, exactly. He's so eminently Polly Shore, but at the same time, I think that this... It, it, it's between this and Son-in-Law, which one is his most likable and empathetic kind of performance, because some of his roles he's just somebody that you laugh at but not necessarily root for and in this one he's a really nice guy who kind of plays against the type of, of Sean Astin's oh, Sean Astin's character is kind of a jerk I have to yeah, say we'll, yeah we'll get into that we'll get to that <laughs> but um yeah it's it's so silly and it's so like an unexpected joy to watch and I was a little worried that maybe it wouldn't hold up because it had been a little while since I've seen it but it totally did of course and Brendan Fraser's performance is just incredible because exactly like you said he doesn't have a lot to say but he makes these great looks and he has absolutely 
it seems zero shame about like walking around with mud covered you know hair and body and <laughs> wearing a, lo- a loincloth which I can't say I complained about then or now <laughs> um, it, it's just it's a very silly but fun movie that is heartwarming at times and completely bonkers at times and yet somehow totally works yeah uh, Polly Shore's character is it's odd because I, I had seen I think the only movie of his before this I had seen all of was in the army now wasn't somebody I was terribly fond of because he is can be kind of annoying but in here it's surprising my wife and I were, I watched all these movies with my wife and um, we, we were both surprised that Polly Shore is kind of not only the kind of, of moral center of the film, uh, but he is also the voice of reason. <laughs> right. Which is surprising, and it's partially because he's actually not... He's actually, compared to a lot of kind of dumb characters you can see in, in movies like sort of Wayne's World, and then especially Bill and Ted, and stuff like that, they're in around the same time. Actually, Wayne's World came out the same year. He is actually one of the smarter dumb guys that you'll see mm-hmm. in a movie, which is partially because he says he watches a lot of Jeopardy. So he just knows a lot of stuff. But he is also just, like you said, a good person. And Sean Astin's character, Dave, just kind of wants to use Link as, again, like a way to become famous and popular and stuff. And he's really just kind of exploiting uh, Link for his own gain. While Stoney just basically says, well, I just want to be his friend. And so, yeah, it was just very surprising that, I mean, I didn't go into the movie expecting Polly Shore to be one of my favorite parts of it. Right. But he's actually, again, he's a good person. He has some funny lines. He actually has some funny lines in the movie, none of which I can remember right now, unfortunately. Yeah, there's a really surprisingly touching scene when they take a school field trip to the anthropology museum Mm -hmm. and link sees, you know, these skeletons from prehistoric creatures. And there's a sort of scene with cavemen and cave women that he comes across and he starts to kind of put two and two together and he kind of has a meltdown. And the Mm -hmm. person that goes to comfort him and like help him during that, that realizes what's going on is Polly Shore. It's stony. Who's like, you know, he just realized that his whole kind of existence was wiped out along with everybody he knew and loved. So he goes up to him and like tells him. Stop it. Talk to me. I understand. Family. 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 Are you okay? It's okay. Look, we're your new family, man. We're your new family. It's okay. That is so not what I was expecting. No. From a Polly Shore character. Well, and also they have stuff like, they kind of call out some certain things that a, a lot of movies do where when they first find Link covered in mud and stuff and is trying to start a fire in Sean Astin's bedroom. Sean Astin's trying, you know, telling him his name and stuff and saying, hey, we go to high, you know, probably high school and stuff. And Stoney is just is just like he can't understand what you're saying, man. So it's just that kind of again the common sense thing. One, just the fact that anybody was saying stuff like that because usually movies don't address that fact. They yeah. just have people talking like that's gonna help or do anything. But the fact that somebody was actually addressing that, but then also the fact that, again that it was Polly Shore who was having that common sense again was just surprising. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I really liked him in the movie. And again, Brendan Fraser, in terms of that those touching moments, a, a follow-up to that moment in the museum where Polly Shore's character says, you know, that we're family and stuff. There's later in the movie, uh, Stoney and Dave get in an argument over Link, and Stoney is calling Dave out on what he has been doing and how he's been exploiting Link. And they start fighting and stuff, and Link kind of breaks them apart. And a moment that should it be really as touching as it is given how stupid most of the movie is is brendan fraser's character forcing them apart then forcing them back together again in a hug and just saying family and that was just really touching i'm getting kind of touched right now just talking about it but yeah it's a moment that again shouldn't work as well as it does but somehow i think with a combination of what Polly shore does and brendan fraser does it kind of works in the film yeah, and I don't think it would have worked with a different actor playing Link. I really don't. I think there is something about the empathy that Brendan Fraser brings to that role and to every role he's in that he, not for a second, does he seem like he's 
you know, in on the joke of like, we're making a movie about a caveman in the eighties. Like he's very sincere in his portrayal and that's what sells it. Yeah. The early nineties though. Oh, nineties. Well, whatever. It feels eighties ish to me. <laughs> what, well, I, I only say that because it is very interesting that the movie is, has a very specific time period. <laughs> That's true. It's very much in the vein of Bill and Ted. With the first, first and second Bill and Ted. The first one being, I think, eighty nine. The second one being ninety one. And I mentioned Rain's World earlier, partially one because the bully in the character was one of the techie friends of Wayne and Garth in Wayne's World. Mm-hmm. Wasn't in the second film for some reason. I don't know why, but he was in the first one. And two, it's very when I pointed out to my wife that this and Wayne's World came out in the same year, she was just kind of amazed, and it is kind of yeah. amazing because Wayne's World has aged pretty well it's kind of it's a 90s film but one that's aged pretty well and it's more of something maybe akin to the mid to late 90s in a way yeah and that's aged a bit better while this film is very much still in the 80s vein 80s yeah this bit. one is much more of a time capsule to me yeah because wayne's world just feels like it exists in its own different universe yeah, and it's much more something you can kind of put on and stuff. It's kind of like comparing the Back to the Future sequels to the first Back to the Future, where the first Back to the Future is very much an 80s movie. Yeah. And a lot of its 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 point of views and its message and stuff, while the sequels are certainly from the late 80s and early 90s, but they they are much more something you can kind of put on with not without the kids today be kind of laughing at some of the the things that are very much of the 80s well this which is very much this film where you have a lot of a lot of kind of late 80s early 90s slang or at least what Polly Shore is claiming is is 90s slang but it's very much this there's one sentence where I think uh, Stoney is talking to Dave's dad where he just has a run of words I think are all just 90s slang <laughs> Mr. Morgan your edge because i'm wheezing on your grind it's just chill because if i had the whole brady bunch thing happening at my pad i'd go grind over there so don't tax my gig so hardcore cruster so yeah it's very much of its time so i guess be aware of that going into it but it can be kind of it can be funny in some of that yeah i mean i like love 90s slang or you know valley slang or all of that stuff right so to me and some of it is just i think Polly shore's own Inventions Like, I don't know how many people were running around saying, ow, my pancreas, or referring to food as grindage, or, you know, <laughs> wheezing the juice. But <laughs> it's fun to hear. It does feel like a different language at times, but I enjoy it. To get into Sean Astin's character, uh, <laughs> like you said, he, oh my god, he is such a dweeb. He's such a, he is such a weird, oh my god, where to start with his character? He, he's such a kind of self-absorbed jerk that is also just a gigantic moron i cannot stress the the <laughs> level of stupidity this 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 guy has i mean literally i think i think link is smarter than him i think it's just he is so stupid because like i said earlier his plan was oh we're going to use link to become rich and famous with sci- the science community in the world and how we'll, we'll have you know get money and have things written about us and blah 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 but again they don't want to tell anybody about link and show them this block of ice before he's thought out they clean link up so he looks like a regular kid so it's right. like well how the hell was anybody going to know this anyway but he doesn't want anybody to know but he still wants to become rich and famous by using link but it just doesn't make any sense and then he's just really awkward like there's a scene at an ice rink where he's trying to chat up the robin character and he says, Robin, don't forget, we've been naked together. And he holds up a picture of, of them when they were kids or babies or something in a bathtub. And it's just so, like... It's, it's so like, cringy. Yeah, it's so cringy <laughs> and embarrassing. It's just like, this is why you don't have a boy, a boyfriend. A girlfriend, do Well, probably a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Yeah. Like, it's just so, like, awkward. And I don't even know how much of it is supposed to be awkward. <laughs> but so he's just so... Oh. Of all the stupid characters we're going to talk about in these movies, he is by far the worst. And he has almost no redeeming qualities, even by the end of the movie. He is just... (laughs) Yeah, I had to wonder at some point why Stoney was even friends with him, because he's... I mean, Stoney just seems like a nice dude, and this guy is a real drag. He really just is. And no no offense to Sean Astin, who is a lovely person, that... I got to meet once at a book signing, and Sam is one of my favorite characters of all. So, 
We love you, Sean Astin. Uh, yeah, we're no. just saying you did a really good job of portraying Dave as a total nincompoop. Even before, right? Like, at the very opening of the movie, well, not the very opening, because the very opening is the Ice Age, but, you know, when we see modern-day L.A., Dave is, like, digging a hole in his yard to make a pool in hopes that they're going to have some sort of after-prom party, and it's like, um, I don't think it's going to happen if it hasn't happened yet. You know what I mean? Like, there's probably a lot of cooler people that have pools in L.A. Yeah, and it's so, just, yeah. And even Stoney is like, dude, high school is basically over. Like, just give it up and wait until college. And I mean, look, he he's playing like a 17 or 18-year-old kid. So, you know, hopefully he figures it out and, like, feels idiotic for his stupid ways when he gets older. Did you like the fact that there was basically no plot to this movie? Again, like I said, it's just stuff kind of happening for 90 minutes. Yeah, I don't think a plot would have really helped it. I think it's much more about the characters and the, like you said, the vignettes, the situations they find themselves in. They basically, you know, just put Link into situations that high schoolers would be in, like going to the mall or going on a field trip or going to a, you know a school dance or whatever and he he is fun to watch in all of those situations so yeah i didn't feel like i needed it to be a super sophisticated Mm -hmm. or dense plot it Mm -hmm. just it sort of meanders and i admire the fact that it stuck to its meanderiness to explain something for a second uh kids a mall uh was where you used (laughs) to go and there'd be a bunch of stores and people did stuff there and then, then uh, the internet happened, and uh, that went away. Um, for more information, go to Ma- see Mallrats and Mallrats 2, Twilight of the Mallrats, which will be coming out eventually. <laughs> uh, and I'm not kidding, that's being made. Oh my gosh. I also, you know, was looking into the casting. I know you mentioned that Polly Shore was going to be playing Link, but I guess they also talked about maybe Nicolas Cage or Jim Carrey. And I could certainly see it, especially if you've seen Valley Girl. I can see why they thought Nicolas Cage. I certainly think he would throw everything he had into it like he does with every role and would have been a very, very intense link, but I think could have still potentially worked. Jim Carrey doesn't feel like the right energy, though. No, especially at that time. I mean, obviously, Jim Carrey is capable of doing some great dramatic stuff. But at that time, I don't see him. I mean, he has dramatic points and stuff like The Mask and stuff, which is in around the same time. But to give the kind of very kind of serious, almost making you want to cry moments that mm-hmm. Brendan Fraser has in this, I don't think he could have pulled off quite as well. He would have gone more for the zany and stuff. And I think he would have lost some of the sincerity of the part. And with both Brendan Fraser, both Jim Carrey and Nicolas Cage, but I think especially Nicolas Cage, you you wouldn't have had the, uh, the thing we mentioned earlier, the kind of doughy-eyed thing, the kind of seeing everything for the first time thing i mean they both can be brilliant actors but they don't really have that quality quality to them i don't think or at least not in the most natural ease that brendan fraser is able to do it so yeah i think out of those people if those if they were seriously considered i think they went i think they went right with brendan fraser out of those people three people and even Polly shore he was the best i think choice of all of those So the next movie on our list to talk about is 1994's Airheads, which is um, definitely a comedy as well. And I would say a little bit in the spirit of Wayne's World, just in the sense of it's about these guys that are musicians and they have pretty high opinions of their talents that maybe some people share, but certainly not everyone. (laughs) The world can kind of laugh at them. And so in an attempt to get taken more seriously, they end up hijacking a radio station. So the backstory, or the way that it starts is that basically Brendan Fraser is trying to get his demo tape heard and he goes to a record label and he gets thrown out by security after talking to a no longer cool Judd Nelson. <laughs> if you've seen The Breakfast Club, he's playing like the anti vendor yeah. character. He's kind of odd. <laughs> but yeah, he, he gets thrown out because they are like, oh, we don't take unsolicited material, but it, se- it seems like they're green lighting, you know, worse and worse bands all the time. And then he and his, his pals played by Steve Buscemi and Adam Sandler, who are brothers in the movie, 
they're um, in the band together and they go to a show at a local club. I believe it was the Whiskey Go-Go. And they aren't very impressed by the band, but they do notice that the band is introduced by a DJ and they decide, hey, maybe we should try to get our tape played on the radio and then we could get a record label to sign us. Well, you know, they break into the radio station through dubious means and... (laughs) They aren't as prepared to be on air, shall we say, as they maybe should have been before they came up with this dubious plan. And things get a little out of hand rather quickly. And they end up, like I said, hijacking the radio station to try to get airplay. And, of course, this whole thing is is played for laughs. But also, it's kind of a a fun little send-up of things like Die Hard. There's a little bit of Dog Day Afternoon in this, which is intentional because the writer rich wilkes actually said he always thought it would be fun to have a comedy version of Mm -hmm. dog day afternoon Mm -hmm. and you know it ends up having fun cameos by a ton of just legendary comic people including chris farley and michael mckean and michael richards and joe mitania who's you know not always a funny guy but he's funny in this for uh, sure two, two ghostbusters are in it Two Ghostbusters are in it, exactly, um, which is fantastic as well. Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson. And then you also have lots of musical cameos as well. Rob um, Zombie. Yep, White Zombie is in it. Lemmy is in it from, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> lots of uh, references to Lemmy, but also he is actually in the movie himself. Uh, Kurt Loder from MTV shows up. Oh, and, a two, and very kind of odd cameos that... They make work in a live action setting. We have cameos from Beavis and Butthead. That is correct. We sure do. So, yeah, it's just a really great cast. Very stacked. One of the very first roles that Adam Sandler had, and according to a great oral history that I will recommend you read, it's on Consequence of Sound. They talk about how it was really tough to even get Adam Sandler cast in this role because his agents really wanted him cast, but the studio didn't think he was a known quantity and that they should, you know, go with it. So it was a fight to get him in the movie, which is kind of funny looking back because he became one of the biggest stars to ever emerge from this movie. But yeah, it's a very fun, loving tribute to rock and roll. It is a time capsule of the kind of transitional music that was happening in 1994 between like punk, heavy metal, and, you know, they make fun a lot of the Seattle sound, which of course was going to be dominating the, the air waves for quite some time. And it's a very, like I said, it's a loving tribute. I don't know, you know, based on what I've read, like the reaction at the time was not very good, but it has gone on to, I think, be a pretty cult classic. Do you remember when you first encountered this movie? When I watched it for this. Oh, Uh, there you go. (laughs) So the only movie I I will say, the only movie I had sort of seen, we'll get into this more when we talk about it, I had sort of seen, I I had seen pieces, bits and pieces of Laughs in the past, but not really seen it. But the one I'd seen the most of was Still Breathing. So yeah, the rest of the stuff, really for the most part, I've been seeing all these movies for the first time. So I knew almost nothing about this. I had seen the poster a lot, the the more famous poster, which shows a long-haired Brendan Fraser, Steve Buscemi, then a short-haired Adam Sandler kind of poking their heads out and there's something behind them or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I knew that image of it, and it's called Airheads, so I figured there were idiots in the movie. But oddly enough, again... Pretty smart idiots. As far as Agreed. movie of idiots are, they're actually not that bad. They're more, like I was talking to my wife about it, it's more just that they don't know how to properly approach certain things. Mm-hmm. They don't know, like, oh, to get a record thing, you should more try to do this instead and do this and do that and whatever. And they don't have the gr- greatest people skills, but they're not really idiots in the usual sense, which was refreshing. But I really didn't know much about it beyond the the poster and some certain stuff I could guess about it. So I went to this pretty blind. Again, you have like a great uh, amount of characters. Chris Farley is wonderful in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michael Richards doesn't do very much. And I don't think he's great in the movie. He basically is being very Michael Richards and is kind of by himself most of the time. But he's probably funnier in most episodes of Seinfeld that you'll see him in. But then you have Michael McKean, who's kind of the slimy owner of this radio station, who's up to something, but we don't know for most of the movie what he's up to and this is an actress uh are you talking about the one that plays Susie? Susie. yeah nina samasco i believe is her name yes and she hasn't done a ton of stuff i know she had i guess a small part in the west ring and is i think as martin sheen's daughter question mark but she was she was great in the movie um as this kind of innocent 
more actually of an airhead probably than the airheads of the movie and it's just trying to get with adam sandler's character like they're holding her hostage but she's just trying to get adam sandler's character a pip in the sack and is kind of a lovely lovely part and then again the radio dj dj ian played by joe pantega is great too and he has a great he has probably the funniest to me funniest line in the movie where he's like okay fine we're we're air the song then just leave us let us go and blah 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 and then he's like he's like before he does his big announcement and introduction on air he's like okay who are you guys my name's pip the band the band name sorry about that he doesn't wear a helmet does he it's right there on the box read it the lone rangers that's original how can you pluralize the lone ranger what's wrong with that well, there's three of you. You're not exactly lone. Shouldn't you be the three rangers? No idea what you're saying right now. You lost me. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Uh, it's so that great. was so that was great. But yeah, I just uh, and again, Chris Farley is great in the movie. He doesn't have tons to do, but uh, it's funny in that very Chris Farley way. And it's actually he a, plays a cop in the movie along with Ernie Hudson. And at one point he gets kind of stuck in a bar. He's trying to find Brendan Fraser's girlfriend who has a copy of the demo that they that they need. And he gets kind of stopped by these this kind of ruffian type people who are giving him trouble. And they're just giving him trouble, giving him, giving him crap and stuff like that. And without, without blinking pretty much, Chris Farley just rips the guy's nipple ring off. Yeah. And it's really just kind of like both me and my wife just kind of put our hands through our mouth. They were like, oh my God. <laughs> no, but, you can't help but like feel it. Yeah. Like, but it really has to respond to a scene like that. So yeah, it was very just that. And it was also very, it was funny. And again, just nice to see him mm-hmm. being capable instead of falling over himself and all that stuff. So yeah, great cast of uh, people. And really, I would say a really fantastic soundtrack, too. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you've got The Replacements on there. You've got Primal Scream. You've got Aerosmith. You've got David Byrne. You've got... There's a great Smiths cover on the soundtrack, too. I forget who does that off the top of my head. I should know right now, but uh, I'm forgetting. Oh, Anthrax. Anthrax does that one. Um, Ramones. So, yeah, it has an awesome soundtrack and it's a really fun movie it's interesting reading about it and like i said that article on consequence of sound has a lot of really great interviews and things but you know the the filmmakers talk about how they really intended it to be a little bit more of like a authentic kind of indie movie where it would be a little bit more grungy and grimy and rock and roll and they got a lot of pushback from the studio of like yes you can make this but you're kind of going to make it on our terms and so they got pushed back about, you know, I guess Steve Buscemi's character was was supposed to have a shirt that said, blow me, and the studio <laughs> didn't want that. So they're like, no, no, we're not going to have that on three for 45 minutes. And then uh, I guess the studio pushed back on Brendan Fraser having a neck tattoo because they were like, oh, that's a little that's a little too edgy for us. And it's oh, like, well, they are like rock guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, he... um, they didn't want them to have leather pants. They oh, felt God. that was too provocative. So oh, God. it, and it was supposed to be an R rated movie, but it ended up being PG 13. And I think you can see that in a way, like there's some scenes where they use language that I'm like, they'd be swearing a lot more, but it, I think it's still okay. Like overall, it still captures the spirit of it. Even if it doesn't go quite as far in that authenticity direction. Yeah, I think you can certainly see that there are, I don't know if they cut some of this to get a PG-13 rating or if they cut before they filmed, but you can certainly see leanings towards R-rated stuff. And I don't know if, I would lean towards, I think that it would have been better if it had been R, as long as it hadn't taken, as long as it hadn't gone too much into leaning into cussing being funny. Sure. As long as you're smart about it, I think it would have been fine. But I think certainly if they had gone more for again, you said that independent feel and that more more of a kind of a punk feel to it and stuff where they are trying to maybe go a bit harsher with some of the parody stuff and the more com- social commentary stuff, and then just kind just with the kind of aesthetic of the film, go more punk with it and more kind of just not totally cynical, but a bit more cynical with it. Um, in terms of the attitudes and some uh, stuff like that, so I think that would have made it a bit better, a bit funnier, and a bit sharper of a film. I mean, I like the film, but I think that would have enhanced it a bit if they could have done maybe more of what they were wanting to do with it. But it's still a fun movie, 
either way, so. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's amazing how sharp they still were able to make it. Mm -hmm. They get away with quite a bit of stuff, so it's not, so, I mean, the director is Michael Lehman, who made Heathers, which I don't know if you've seen Heathers, but I've it's, heard of it, yeah. it's a very dark comedy that is very much R-rated. I mean, it's a it's a comedy, ultimately, about, like, teenagers killing people <laughs> under the guise of making it look like suicide and it, it sounds like it would never get made today because it wouldn't but you know that was like this guy's background and then he'd also done Hudson Hawk which huh, is huh. The, the Bruce Willis musical that I actually kind of love even though most people think it's not very good but you know he clearly like went outside the mainstream with a lot of the movies he made and so he was probably like the right person to direct this kind of material even if they had to make some cuts and make some revisions to please the suits there is just something funny about a, a movie like this having to be approved by people who are clearly just like so out of touch with the scene that this movie is depicting but it it still gets a lot of those details right and i think it gets them right because wilkes and because lehman really had like lived it and were familiar with this kind of music and these kind of dudes and they're having fun with it while also paying tribute to it i think this movie wouldn't work if it was totally condescending to the people in the band or to the fans that were outside but it seems more like a celebration than a send-up like you said they don't aren't like totally talking about the three main guys and saying oh you guys are a bunch of idiots we should laugh at them they are just kind of you want to you want them to be successful you're kind of frustrated that they're going about it in a very dangerous idiotic way and you're frustrated that their lack of experience and knowledge of how these things should work makes them so short-sighted with their goals in the movie in terms of holding up the state radio station and what that will mean and stuff. But you are rooting for them to succeed and stuff. And they are ultimately, I mean, Steve Buscemi's character Rex is the most cynical of them and he is kind of an ass, but he, again, ultimately, I think for the most part in all the ways that really matter is mostly a good person. And I think the other two are especially good people. They're just, Again, idiots who don't know what they're doing. And they're a band that hasn't found itself yet and mm -hmm. can't really pinpoint. They ask at one point, the, I think the DJ or Michael McKean asked, well, what type of music do you do? And they'd give this very vague, almost high school answer where they're just trying to avoid answering the question because they don't really have an answer to it. Well, we, we ain't the rash. We could play anything. It's more like a power slot. slot. Power slot. Power slot. Power slot. Power power slot. Power. We don't like to limit ourselves to labels. But they're still lovable. You enjoy watching them. But at the same time, they're not, you know, they'll make fun of some of the movie music that was being becoming popular at the time. Be making fun of how, at least from their point of view, rock and punk and stuff was struggling and all that. And making fun of music that was becoming popular and all that stuff. So there is a love for music, especially the type of music that they're promoting. But they, they are still going to point out, hey, this some of the stuff that is bad and some of the stuff that's going on actually in the real world is really stupid. Yeah, especially, you know, I think the the 1994 time period, I could have this a little bit wrong, but somewhere in that like late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of, you know, consolidation of radio stations and payola was starting to be a big thing. And there were definitely record labels out there that were just suits trying to capitalize on the young hip sound and they were you know kind of bringing in these kind of not very talented people that was potentially eclipsing really talented people so i think that you know maybe if you're watching this from today's eyes in the world of like the internet and spotify and anybody can put something on youtube or tiktok and it gets heard it's a little bit different like the venues to getting your your sound out there were much more closed because you had to get you know some sort of support to get a gig mm -hmm. so you might need to do a demo which costs money and then you know if you want to get a gig you have to have airplay but to get airplay they want to know what kind of gigs you have done so mm -hmm. it did seem like a bit of a closed loop yeah and i can appreciate that struggle that you know legit good bands and not so good bands were maybe going through at that time yeah i mean we mentioned or at least i mentioned this movie being made now and i don't think you could you have to very much change it because i think I'm certainly not a music expert, but I think the 90s, from what I know, and I could be widely off with this, I think it was probably the last decade where radio was really keen, and radio yeah. was really the decade where you can kind of make it through that. Like you said, now you have the internet, 
and stuff like that. And you can kind of, anybody can publish up something online. Not, that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to see it. It could be listened to by nobody or a very small group of people. But it's much easier to get your stuff out there. So it would be hard to make this plot work because you'd be like, you know, you don't necessarily need to go to radio for this. So, yeah, this is really the last time you could have done this type of, of thing. And I think so it kind of is almost a time capsule of I mean, radio's still around, but the kind of twilight golden days of radio, music radio. For sure. And, you know, I mean, I have a real love for any movie that involves radio stations because I grew up loving radio and I majored in it in college. I worked at a radio station for a little while. So I always have a soft spot in my heart for it, even though I do think, unfortunately, it has become a bit of an outmoded medium, at least for now. Maybe it'll make a comeback one day like every other form mm -hmm. of media seems to have done. But, you know, it, it was kind of fun to see, like, people actually going and rallying outside in the parking lot of a radio station and cars, you know, going up and down the Sunset Strip actually listening to the radio and not just, mm -hmm. you know, playing something from a satellite station or, or you know, yeah. from a phone. So I enjoyed that aspect of it a lot, and that might just be the sentimental old millennial in me, but that's how I felt. Well, it's also kind of like, I haven't seen Mallrats, but I intend to. I mean, want to see that, and if Kevin Smith makes his Mallrats sequel, I want to see that too. But it's kind of like, I well, how I assume I will feel when I watch that movie, where you kind of watch it, and you're kind of, especially if you're around the age of Rosalie and I and stuff, where you experience radio or you kind of experience malls when they were more popular and stuff. You look on it with a nostalgia and with a happiness, but then there's also a sadness too, because this thing that actually had good points, it has both, you know, radio and malls and stuff have bad points too, but they have these kind of good aspects to them that it's sad that they're kind of going on the wayside, especially malls and stuff where both those things had, like you said, they're all in, in this movie, they're kind of all gathering around this radio station. There's a sense of, of community Mm -hmm. and connection and stuff that you can get from that and that you can get from malls and stuff too where you can not just go shopping but they would have events and do all these things and stuff and it would be a place to be and there's just, just, just a sense of, of, of place and identity with it both in good ways and bad ways you see people rallying around this and it's like oh it's kind of sad that we've lost this because of the good things that came with it and mm -hmm. you know some kind of cynical stuff came more out of it and sort of a disconnect and kind of a more music turning more into kind of what people some film executives are referring to film as as content mm -hmm. instead of more of an art form so i think you can kind of look at this movie and some other movies from i think the 90s too like in like mall rats and see kind of a sadness to them as well but we should we've kind of danced around him we should highlight him just because he is the reason we're doing this uh brendan fraser like we said is just very likable in the movie and all that stuff but again he's really he does a lot of silly stuff in it he says a lot of realistically stupid things in the movie i mean i really have met people like these three guys um sure. just don't know how the world is supposed to work i like all of the three actors for giving it that reality and stuff even though adam sandler is very much in a 90s adam sandler mode with the way he talks and stuff which is not quite my cup of tea, but that's fine. But Brendan Fraser, again, he does the silly stuff, but again, gives it the proper pathos. He balances this kind of silly and serious stuff just really well. And it's, it's not for every actor to be able to do that. I really respect actors who can kind of go from silly or humorous to deadly serious or scary or whatever, just on, you know, a snap of the fingers and stuff, but make it seem totally natural and it's not a jarring or whatever. It just seems like perfect in the way that they do that. So again, Brandon Fraser just continues, to, I think, to do that in this movie. And again, is really the heart of it. I don't think the the love letter to music, which I think this partially is, would be as successful if it wasn't for his character and the sincerity that Brandon Fraser brings to it. Okay, so our next film that we're going to talk about is a 1997 movie called Still Breathing. This was, I think, a pretty independent 
Lee made movie uh, written directed by a guy named James F. Robinson, sometimes credited as J. F. Robinson, who uh, didn't do very much. I think the only other stuff he did bef- after this was a documentary that he, I think, directed, and then maybe it was one or two other things of not much consequence that he did before this movie. Anyway, it takes place partially in Texas, San Antonio, and partially in L.A., where Brendan Fraser's character, who is an artist called Fletcher McBracken, and if you don't think that's a silly name, <laughs> uh, and he's in Texas, and there's in L.A., there's this woman who, along with one of her friends, basically is a uh, con artist who hooks up with these guys just so she can get money from them and then finds out ways for them to break up with her so she can keep the painting or the money or whatever that they have given to her. Uh, her name is Rosalind w- Willoughby and basically uh, Brendan Fraser's character it's a trait in his family as said by him and his uh, grandmother Ida played by Celeste Holm that the men in the family going back to at least his grandfather they don't say if it goes back further than that where the men of the family have visions of, at some point in life, have visions of the people that they are destined to marry. And he has been making these art portraits of these magazines, of these faces and stuff of women, and trying to find this woman that he's destined to be with. And he finally has, at the beginning of the movie, he has this vision of Rosalind being mugged and stuff. He finds out, oh, that is the person. So he goes off on a quest to find her, and eventually does find her. And Rosalind, though, is very cynical. She doesn't really believe in love and stuff because relationships in her past haven't worked out, um, which has probably partially led to her con artist ways and stuff. So she's very resistant to Fletcher and the genuine good qualities that he has. So the movie is about him trying, kind of trying to win her over and her, for reasons that will be, make sense if you see the movie, is trying to initially trying to con him out of some money that he she thinks he has though he doesn't actually through misunderstanding and uh, yeah it's just kind of a love story between the two of them and it should be said there are comedic elements of this but this does lean more towards the dr- romantic drama than romantic comedy or romantic uh, dramedy and i pick this one this one was more my pick as rosalie i'm sure will mention it was the only one that i think she hadn't seen and i picked it because it was a movie that i had seen many years ago when I was 15 or 16 I had just had my wisdom teeth pulled and was high on uh, whatever medicine, pain medicine that was and caught a part way into the movie, my stepdad had said oh I like this movie so we watched part way towards the end, however much it was and I remember liking it at the time so I picked it for this, partially because I liked it and partially because while he had made dramas before in and around the other movies we had we've already talked about i wanted to highlight this one because i had liked it when i previously had seen it and it was a chance to kind of talk about him doing a more straight dramatic part and how he could excel with that too so i sat down with my wife to watch it and apparently i had i remembered almost none of this movie i remembered kind of the last image of the movie but that was really it i remembered really surprisingly almost none of the movie and unfortunately at least for me i'm interested to see how you feel rosalie i really didn't like this movie (laughs) and it really almost none of it worked and i feel kind of bad for suggesting it (laughs) don't feel bad for suggesting it because Brendan Fraser is very attractive in this movie, so yes. it is great for fans of that. And there's some really great music in it. And I will say there's some really beautiful cinematography moments as well, in particular a slideshow that takes place in a house and the slide images end up getting projected onto the characters' bodies, and that's really lovely. I can tell you're really dancing around. <laughs> um, well... I wanted to like this. I really wanted to like this. And it's funny because I saw a preview for it while I was kind of figuring out which streaming service I was going to try to use to watch it. And the preview was filled with, like, just images and then, like, pull quotes of people praising the movie. So I was like, oh, this is going to be really great. It'll probably be this, like, underrated classic that I just haven't somehow heard of. And Celeste Holm is in it. And she's, you know, a legend. And Lou Rawls has a role. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, not good. No. Uh, I'm very sorry. I, I really did want to love it. I was, I'm was i comforted to know that you also didn't love it because I I told Andy, my boyfriend, who watched it with me this evening, that I would watch it again if there was a Brendan Fraser Q&A live and he was going to actually be there for it. That's probably the only circumstance I would watch this a second time. 
time. Yeah, I wouldn't probably ever watch this again. I, again, I was excited going into it because I remember liking it quite a bit. Now, I didn't love it, but I remember being very fond of it when I had watched it back in high school and stuff. And I was surprised by how much, maybe it was just evolving taste or not being mm-hmm. high on medicine, but it was just surprising by how much I didn't, I actively didn't like it. I think part of the problem is you can really, I mentioned that the director and writer of this hadn't done very much before this and hadn't done very much after this. And you can really tell in the direction, which again, there are some nice shots in there that are genuinely, there's one shot near the end of the movie of like a tree and a leaf falling or something that Mm -hmm. is genuinely a pretty beautiful shot that deserves to be in a much better movie. So there's some nice stuff in there. And the the plot of it is not totally unworkable of this guy who has visions and stuff. It's handled in, of his love and stuff. It's handled in a very odd, clunky way. But it's ultim- But you can tell by the way it's shot. It's shot in a very amateurish way with not very much style for the most part. It's just very much like establishing shots, like a roaming shot, because that's what you do, you know. And then the writing of it is very immature, in the mm-hmm. sense that I joked with my wife that I this is something that I would have written, well, hopefully not quite as badly, but I would have almost written in like high school or something, where it's just somebody who has a very limited understanding of what love is mm-hmm. and stuff and how to talk about it, and it starts with like the movie starts with this narration, uh, the it bookends with narration from Rosalind, beginning and the end of the movie has a narration from her, and it begins with this very kind of pretentious narration about. There are two things I always try to believe but couldn't. One was that there's a perfect man waiting out there for every woman. The other was that true love gives you happiness. In real life, I spent so many years dodging men who were so much less than perfect. And when I did fall in love, happiness never came. So I grew up and put away those childish things. And finally stopped holding my breath for a man. And it's just very eye-rolling and kind of painful to listen to. So I think that's part of the problem with the movie, is I don't think the writer-director had enough experience to really tackle this material with the maturity and intelligence that you really... And the wit, I think, of it that it deserved. Yeah, the same issue that you had about it feeling... Like, it didn't have a lot of substance behind what love is. It was very much like a, I don't even want to say a romance novel idea of love. It was very, like, what you think love might be like when you're in sixth grade imagining yourself as a grown-up. Yeah. And I love, again, I love the people that are in this movie. I think they're doing their best with the material. But there's really not much in terms of character development. No. I felt especially that... Fletcher as a character is just it, there, he's so one dimensional because his entire life seems to be about finding the girl from his dream and to the to the extent that like you mentioned he has an entire wall collage of like these cutouts of women from magazines that he's hodgepodge together to like make his dream girl and in the Truman show that works because we've seen like Truman and this girl that he met when he was young and he's now trying to find her again, and he keeps seeing glances of her in magazines. But in this, it's just like, what are you doing? And then he brings her in, and like she doesn't even seem to react that much to the fact that he does this. He just says, I like girls, and she's like, okay, cool. That was kind of a funny line, though. Was it was like... funny, but I was like, he kind of just, yeah, it's very odd. It also just feels like these two people would have nothing in common. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Uh, Other than the fact that he's seen her in a dream, I don't know what he sees in her because she is so guarded and so, like, almost pushing him away a lot of the time. And he is this very sweet person who's, like, a puppeteer that plays jazz in the street. And, like, I did enjoy the puppeteer scenes, although it's very clear he's not the one that's running the puppets. But I enjoyed those scenes. I thought they were cute and sweet. And I did enjoy... The conversation that Grandma Ida has with Rosalind, where she's kind of talking about the stone monuments, the cairns, and yeah. what those mean. I thought that was a really good scene. What is their function? Remembering. Remember things you never want to forget. I built that one. Yeah. Oh, it's been there a long time now. What's it for? In 1946, I lost my. 
my baby girl. I slept out here on the porch all that summer. And that fall, I just had to be alone. And finally, I built the castle. So there are hints here that there is something deeper that could have been made. I just, I feel like it needed a second pass by maybe another writer or an editor. And it needed to kind of make something about Fletcher more grounded than he is because he's such a manic pixie tr- pixie dream boy. <laughs> he just like, you know, he doesn't seem at all realistic to the point where I, he's not even like a good fantasy of what a, a guy would be like who's romantic. He's just, I don't know. He, there's just something odd. Well, one, I will say these, no, and no offense to the actors in this. This really of isn't course. what I'm about to say. is not really, it's usually, if not, if not always not a fault, the fault of the actor, but these two actors have no chemistry with each other. No, they don't. And I'm sure these, these two actors, Brendan Fraser and Joanna going, they probably got along fine, but they just don't work with each other. And they don't have, you know, I'm very fond of talking about how one of the reasons why Marty, which we did talk about twice, actually, is the movie with Orange Borgnine and Betsy Blair from 1955 is such a good movie is because you see them talking with each other about stuff you would naturally talk about and about stuff that would help you connect with somebody. And this movie, you and in so many movies, you don't have that here. They kind of talk about they they are, they are talking. They do have moments where they're talking about, but again, nothing of substance that would help you connect with another person, right. and nothing that would bring out their personalities and things that you would find cute or enduring, or beautiful or funny. And it's just a very shallow bunch of scenes that that because of that. The movie, to me, felt very much like a first act and half of a second act, where you don't really have that second act, half of the second act where you develop stuff more, or that third act where you kind of pay off that stuff. It just kind of has half of a movie and then it ends, because you don't really get that depth you get as you go through a movie. So I just think, yeah, it's just really a problem. I feel like this could have been a stronger movie if it could have, like, really leaned into more of like a a romantic comedy or even like a screwball comedy where they play up the humor a bit more. And there are some humorous moments and humorous characters. For example, there's one of his bandmates who comes over Mm. to his house and has a lot of things to say and, you know, starts talking fast and awkwardly around Roz and just kind of makes everybody like, what is he talking about? Well, you just, well, you're just visiting. This is a good place to live. This my grandma came here. It was like Cameron. she is a pistol. This one, nude, half the day. She Cameron, wasn't from here. Cameron. Well, the, the other half, she's close. I mean, she's not a nude granny. She, uh, we should probably get going. You gonna? You you driving? No, you're you're gonna take the bike, right? Right? Oh yo! I'm biking. Right. That's why I got the bike. That's why. Is to bike. And we'll see you there. Occasionally, I will ride my bike, and this is this is okay. one of the occasions. He was funny, and he talks. He has one scene where he complains that tamales have never had the best like cinematic <laughs> moment that they deserve, and I enjoyed that. No, he's a um, I mean, he's an actor. Yeah, called Toby Hush Huss. Um, yeah, Toby Huss, and he's also the Wiz on uh, Seinfeld. If you've seen that episode, yeah, and he was. Yeah, and he was um, he was in uh, Adventures of Pete and Pete as well, uh, yeah. poo poo yeah. like that. Um, and he's a character actor who's been in a lot of different stuff. My wife and I are very fond of him, and he's actually good enough. But actually, kind of certain points when he popped up, it's like, can we follow him instead? Can That's we... what we were saying here too. Um, <laughs> He'd be the main character. <laughs> yeah, he was he was fun, and I did enjoy some of the funny lines, like uh, when Brendan Fraser is talking about how. He's been sleeping on the piano because he's going through, quote, my firm phase, which I just couldn't stop laughing at. So if they had done a little bit more, like, humorous stuff, I think it could have potentially worked, at least been, like, a funny, quirky rom-com. Or if it was going to be more serious, then they needed bigger stakes where, you know, this would have been more cliche, but having him actually get, you know, duped by her and having a little bit more heartbreak going on and like a little bit more again like higher stakes some sort of force that is potentially keeping them apart and then 
a bigger understanding or character moment of why she ultimately changes her mind and decides to go back to him. Hopefully, if we do another Brandon Fraser episode, we can find a better drama that he was in that would better highlight his skills as, as a dramatic actor where he has much, much better material to work with. But yeah, this one was disappointing. I wouldn't really... I know this one is popular online. It has a decent-ish rating on IMDb. I think Amazon has a good rating. I think on Rotten Tomatoes, the audience score for it is quite high. So I think a lot of people do like this movie. So maybe you'll like it. But I don't think either either Rosalie and I could really recommend uh, this one. Again, you know, there are some things to like about it. But it doesn't work as a whole. The, you know, again, I, <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm quoting fangirls and fanboys at this point. But there are a lot of people, if you look on, you know, for example, Letterboxd that say, well, you know, it's Brendan Fraser at his hottest or whatever, which... I mean, he, he is attractive in it, so you've got that going for you, and he is romantic. He, but he's it's basically like a feature-length version of, if you've seen Bedazzled, you know, the character when he becomes, <laughs> like, the most sensitive man in the world and cries at the sunset and his girlfriend dumps him. Like, he's basically that guy throughout this entire movie, and it does get exhausting. So just be prepared for that but there is some really nice music in it both classical and jazz Lou Rawls is in it and that's really cool and apparently I did find like a behind the scenes making of whatever that said that both Joanna Going and Brendan Fraser really like spent a lot of time in San Antonio kind of getting to know the jazz scene and talking to locals and so you know they did try to make it authentic and if it was a good experience for them and if some people like it then that's good but yeah I don't feel like I will be revisiting this anytime soon. movie that we're talking about today is one of my favorite movies not just of Brennan Fraser but of just in general movies I put this on anytime I'm in a bad mood anytime I'm sick if I'm in a good mood and I just want something to relax to if I feel like I need to show it to somebody that hasn't seen it I have definitely seen this over a hundred times and perhaps more than 200 I don't know. I've lost count and it's okay. And that movie is Blast from the Past. It came out in 1999 and it was directed by Hugh Wilson and it stars somebody from one of my other favorite movies and that is Alicia Silverstone as well as supporting performances from Christopher Walken, Sissy Spacek, Dave Foley and a number of other folks that a baby, pop up. A baby faced Nathan Fillion. That's who I was going to mention. Yes, he definitely pops up. You also have a few other notable folks, including Rex Lynn and Dale Raul and Joey Slotnick and, you know, a few people that you'll probably rec- recognize even if you don't necessarily know their names. There, There's some character actors in here that pop up. But basically the story, the premise of this movie, which definitely is, I would say, a screwball comedy in the best way, is that you have, it starts out in the 1960s, early 1960s, and it's around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and Christopher Walken plays a very eccentric scientist who's brilliant but weird, and he has been building a bunker or a fallout shelter underneath his house in case there is some sort of nuclear war. So they're having a party. His wife is pregnant. His wife is played by Sissy Spacek. And uh, in the middle of the party, they hear that, you know, maybe there's some activity going on in Cuba. And so he tells everybody to leave. He takes her down into this shelter. And they're thinking they'll just stay under there until, you know, this blows over. And then they hear some noise and they think that it is the atomic bomb or whatever hitting. But it's really just a plane crashing in their backyard but they don't realize that so they lock it because they don't want to go up and be you know turned into radioactive people and they end up staying down there for over 30 years so their child which turns out to be Brenda Fraser is named Adam because of course he's like the first man in this new world that they think they have to populate 
and he grows up in a very literally sheltered home where his parents are, you know, teaching him how to dance and teaching him all about, you know, being polite and all these things. At some point, they decide it's going to be safe to go back up to the surface. And so they send him up and uh, the world is, you know, the world of the 90s. And he meets Alicia Silverstone. There's a lot more to it than that. This was, you said one that you'd seen parts of, but not the whole thing before. Is that right? Yes, I had. I did very much enjoy the movie. Again, Brendan Fraser is great. I think Alicia Silverstone, it's been a long time since I'd seen her in something i have seen parts of clueless not all of it i know that's terrible but i forgot how charismatic and wonderful she can be but in this she's kind of edgy and stuff to kind of edgy to adam's naivete and kind of pureness and stuff and she cusses and is very kind of obviously for obvious reasons she's much more aware of the world and all that stuff but she's has good qualities too she's a better version in a way that that of what the female character in Still Breathing should have been, where she is kind of cynical and stuff, and Adam kind of thaws her out and stuff, but it's a much more believable way, and she has much more believable growth and stuff. But she's also, even before that, after a certain point when her and Adam really start working together to help him get supplies to go back to down into the bunker and stuff, she really becomes very almost motherly to him, she becomes very protective, and stuff while she's also falling in love with him and all that stuff so yeah it's it's, it's a very loving it's a very kind of lovable performance and i loved seeing her on screen as much as i love seeing brendan fraser on screen yeah i really love her character in this and you're right i think this is what the Roz character in still breathing could have potentially been like where she has an edge but we also see her heart because the very first scene where with adam her. meets her is he's trying to sell a few of his dad's baseball cards at a hobby shop because he's like, well, I need more money for the supplies I'm getting. He has no idea these things are worth anything. He's just like, oh, maybe maybe they'll buy these. And so he walks in, and he's about to get ripped off by the shop owner. And Eve, played by Alicia Silverstone, has a conscience about it and basically tells him, like, one card is worth thousands and thousands of dollars versus you were going to get, like, 500 for this entire box, Right. So she gets fired. He convinces her to take him to a Holiday Inn because he just needs somewhere to stay. And they just hit it off, even though she's very like, okay, I'm not going to, I shouldn't get in a car with a stranger. And, you know, you're, you're very strange. And she definitely questions, like, his motives. But, you know, ultimately, he does have, like, that very winning, sweet attitude that like we've talked about you know that he kind of exudes in multiple movies and so she's like all right how bad can it be like he's gonna give her this valuable card so she agrees to take him and of course it blossoms from there i also really enjoy dave foley's performance yes his roommate troy who is a gay man and you know yes if you look back on it like some of it is played a little stereotypically but i still think it's a very kind of like loving um, and especially for the late nineties, like fairly progressive character and the way that he and Adam interact, I think is very sweet as well. So I really enjoyed that aspect. Yeah. He is also a bit protective of him as well. And there's, there's really is a love. All three of them find, I mean, he, Adam and naturally kind of just loves them, but even Troy really learned to love him as well and stuff, despite him being very realistically odd. I mean, he is very... If I met Adam on the street, I would not want to interact with him for very long because he is odd in a way that is a little unsettling just because of so how absent-minded he is of how things are supposed to work in the 90s. Right. But back to Dave Foley, he is probably the funniest character in the movie. He is he has so many great lines and stuff. He interacts with Alicia Showstone and Brendan Fraser so well. And my wife and I were laughing at him a whole bunch. And I think the most at him and then at anybody. And like you said, he does play a sympathetic representation of a gay man. And like you said, there is, it leans towards stereotypes more than I would wish. But it isn't, it doesn't get to the point where it's like really offensive or anything. Which they no, it never seems to be like making fun of the fact that he's gay. It's, it's just like a part of who he is. Yeah, and it's very much very accepting of it. I mean, obviously when he says that he, or Alicia Silverstone tells, uh, Eve tells Adam that Troy is gay, Adam doesn't understand the new connotation, the new definition of gay, so he's just like, well, good for you. Well, we try. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the fact that Eve is just very offhanded, oh yeah, he's gay. 
it's it's very much it's, that's just you know that's who he is it's not a big deal whatever right. and it's, it's a very accepting thing i think it was very was very good and even there's even a trans woman or yeah or non-binary person who makes a brief appearance who i don't think is really being made fun of it's more being more made fun of because before adam goes up calvin uh, who christopher walken's character goes up to kind of check things out and he just sees it at night and it all just looks like a hellhole and stuff so he goes back with the wrong information but he interacts with this non-binary person and i think i don't think it's really making fun of her or them but it's more making fun of christopher walken's character being just oblivious and making more making more fun of his character of it so you survived the blast the blast (laughs) honey i've survived a host of things like the song says a country boy can't survive did you say you were a country boy cute little old man if you want a boy, I can be a boy. And if you want a girl, I can be a girl. Hell, I can be whatever you want me to be. Really? Uh-huh. And it's all yours for a remarkably low price of $200. And if you act now, I may even throw in some free lawn furniture. Now, how about that? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I have to go. So I think that was pretty good of the time as well that they for both of these people in the LGBT community, they're not making they're not laughing at them. They're just more laugh they're they're more laughing at the people who are misunderstanding them than anything yeah. else so i think that was totally good. and you mentioned that troy has a lot of great lines i cannot tell you how many times i've said the line and my sisters and i say this to each other sometimes i have to go to the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> that is just one of my favorite exchanges of like you know alicia silverstone's character is really just wanting to have like a, a private moment and so she like sends him off and just you know, he leaves and he says, I have to go to the bathroom. Anyways, if you've seen it, you know. I, I want to know if, if Brendan Fraser likes dancing, because I think in at least two of these films, he does that. Yeah, you know, Some sort absolutely. of dancing thing, whether comedic or just seriously. And he dances with two people in this nightclub. These two women in this nightclub who, He's I mean, at least... He's a really good dancer. And, I mean, just unbelievable. That scene where the swing dancing is phenomenal. Yeah, and Brendan Fraser's character comes off very much like a perfect guy in a lot of ways. But I think... Going back to still breathing again, I think this is a more a better way of approaching a guy who's pretty perfect in a mm-hmm. way that works much better. One, it is played for laughs a lot of the time, but also it just kind of makes sense, and you still see the flaw, certain flaws in him too. He's not absolutely, you know, perfect. As you get through the movie, he gets more rounded and stuff. But that's brilliant. But on also the 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 childlikeness of it, we mentioned at the at the top and throughout this that. Brendan Fraser has an ability to kind of look at the world with this idea or this point of view of seeing stuff for the first time. And there's this very kind of beautiful, very touching scene, both for the, I think, the audience and for Eve and for Troy, where Adam sees the ocean for the first time. And it's just this very touching scene where he just kind of takes off the rollerblades he had on and stuff and just just walks into the into the ocean, he just plays in there and stuff. And it's just really touching and heartwarming and really is probably one of my favorite parts of the movie and possibly my favorite serious part of the movie yeah that scene gets me every time i definitely well up when i see it because he just he had such an appreciation for things that everyone around him is just taking for granted i mean even earlier when he first looks up and he sees the sky and everybody's like what is it the sky the sky where up there I don't see anything. Just look! What is it? He says he sees something. What is it? The sky! I see it, Mommy! I have never in my life seen anything like it before! (laughs) They don't understand why he's so excited, but it's the first time, Mm -hmm. you know, he's looked up and not seen a roof over his head. So, I do love that part. I think he plays it so believably when it should be like the dorkiest thing ever, but really it pulls at your heartstrings because you believe this guy. Yeah, he see you 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 see the beauty in the ocean or the sky because you see the beauty you see, you see that he is seeing the beauty of it and stuff. Mm-hmm. So you really again it helps you appreciate just how beautiful the small things are, how beautiful the world in general can be. I also love the soundtrack to this movie which is a lot of Perry Como and some very, very 90s choices of artists, including Dishwalla and Squirrel Nut Zippers and Cherry Pop and Daddies and Everclear, of course. So, yeah, there's a funny kind of mixing of the two worlds of, like, the 1960s, you know, very sunny kind of music and then 
the very alternative 90s. So mm-hmm. I enjoy that. There's a certain uh, jokes about sex and his obliviousness to it. Or she's also trying to help him find a wife and stuff in two weeks. And he's like, oh, I can maybe get your girlfriend or get you laid, but I don't know if I can get you a wife. And he doesn't understand what laid means. So at one point they're having food at a diner. And he says, what do you mean you can get me laid? Uh, can we talk about that a little later? Of course. Right. And then um, early when he gets to the Holiday Inn, he, he gets a bit upset because he tells the, the bellboy, Thank you. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let bed bugs bite. That's what my mom always says. I'm really beginning to miss, by the way. I'm sorry. It's my first night away from home. How old are you? 35. You don't look 35. How old do I look? Oh, 25, around there. Hmm. I guess living up here makes people look older. Up here on the 18th floor? And then at one point, when Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, do have a kiss, Eve asks, Adam, I know this is stupid. But humor me. I never had sex before. Is that possible? And so this is funny, this stuff, and again, genuinely, genuine reactions to the experiences he hasn't had, and just his weird responses and things he's saying about his mother and dad and all this other stuff. Yeah, it's interesting that we're kind of bookending the show with first we had Encino Man, and now we have Blast from the Past, because in some ways, the very similar premises, albeit like Blast from the Past, is a period of only like thirty something years, and Encino Man, it's thousands to millions of years the person has sort of traveled through time but it's still kind of that coming into a very unfamiliar surroundings and having to get used to it and people reacting to Brendan Fraser in these roles and in these situations and him looking for love and all these things so he just does a really good job with that and it makes it feel so fresh and so new even though there are versions of I guess premises like this where somebody is in an unusual situation and you know confused about what's going on but he plays it so so well and again you're right the chemistry we talked about not having chemistry in the (laughs) last movie the chemistry between Alicia Silverstone and Brandon Fraser is like through the roof from the first time they meet like there's just a spark there you know they're flirting and they're talking and even though she still thinks he's odd like there's something there and it definitely is believable that they would want to get together in some ways it's like yeah she's living in the modern world but part of her is an old soul and i think that's why she responds to who adam is and his love for his parents and his kindness that's something that she seems to be searching for herself so how did you uh like going to these movies again even the one that you had seen for the first time i know neither of us particularly liked it but how did you was this a nice kind of revisit was it a blast from the past (laughs) it was it made me want to watch more brennan fraser movies in fact i happened to be at a goodwill where there were like a two-pack of the mummy and the second the mummy returns and i bought them because i was like i need to have these so i am definitely going to watch more brendan fraser movies i really want to go ahead and check out some of the ones that i haven't seen before so i definitely want to see now and then i know he's only in it a little but i want to see that i want to see gods and monsters i've yeah, actually never seen george of the jungle which is hard to believe i saw it a lot as a kid i don't know if i ever saw the whole thing from beginning to end but yeah yeah i want to watch that and then you know i'm actually curious about some of the stuff he's done in the intervening years that Maybe it hasn't gotten the best reputation, but I'm still curious about. So stuff like The Air I Breathe or Journey to the End of the Night or even even Furry Vengeance, which I know (laughs) is like it looks dumb, but it also has a lot of people in it that I like. So I'm willing to go with that. Yeah, I'm just I'm curious about it. So we'll see. But I'm I'm very excited for his future roles, too, and and what we're going to see hopefully coming out in the next year or so. So now we'll talk about some of the movies that are coming to blu-ray particularly on boutique labels uh as is evidenced by the name of our show one that i'm actually really excited about and i just read about today is that fire in the sky a 1993 movie that is still i think one of the most underrated and scary alien movies is coming to blu-ray on screen factory 
It's going to be released on June 21st. And if you've never seen it, highly recommend this movie, which I think is based on a supposedly true story about, you know, people that see a mysterious light in the forest and they go to investigate and one of them actually does get abducted. And so it's definitely a creepy, fascinating story. It stars D.B. Sweeney and Robert Patrick and Peter Berg and several other folks. And um, this is one that has, I think, languished on just DVD for a long time. I think even that was a little hard to come by. So this is a very exciting one for me. And then another one that I'm excited about that's actually coming to 4K is Kino has just announced that they're going to do a 4K release of the Taking of Pelham 123, oh, the original. Cool. And holy cow, I love that movie so damn much. That is the one with Walter Matthau and Robert Shaw and Martin Balsam and Hector Elizondo and Tony Roberts. And it is a killer movie. And I do think you should watch it even if you've seen the remake. It's one of those movies that is just, I say, perfect from start to finish. And it is going to be out. I don't know if the date has been posted yet, to be honest. But it's coming out on Kino and it'll be on the market later this year. So I'm not sure exactly when the date is, but I will definitely be picking that up. And then another Kino that I'm excited for, another 4K is the movie Out of Sight, which I adore, and it stars George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez. It's a great Steven Soderbergh movie that, if you haven't seen it, I cannot recommend highly enough. It's really fun, and it's, you know, Elmore Leonard, his material is always, you know, worth checking out. I love his crime writing, and this is one of those movies that I feel like was adapted perfectly by Soderbergh. So Out of Sight is going to be released on June 28th, and that is, once again, coming to Kino. And uh, just, uh, I don't think these were announced the last the last episode we did, but uh, Criterion announced its June schedule. There's five of those films that they announced. I'm only going to talk about three of them. On June 21st, Shaft is going to come out. It's a Blu-ray of that, along with a 4K version of it. It's a 4K Blu-ray combo. They have the original Shaft movie. They also have a special feature of the 1972 follow-up, Shaft's Big Score. Then they have a recent movie that some people who follow award season and stuff will be happy about. The Worst Person in the World is coming out uh, June 28th. And then at the end of June, also on June 28th, is the controversial 19 uh, movie Pink Flamingos by everybody's favorite messed up grandpa uh, John Waters. And then from Flickr Alley something I don't think we have talked about before. Something that I think uh, Rosalie will be happy about. There's a double feature they were releasing of two long lost film noirs, uh, The Guilty and High Tide. Yes. Which I know nothing about but look interesting. I think Rosalie will probably be very excited about that and will probably buy that when that comes out. Heck yeah uh, I will. Okay so just to give everybody a preview of what's going to come up, come up over the next three months. Next month in May we're going to be talking about some of the films of Pedro Almodovar, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, and Volver. And then in June for Pride Month, Rosalind and I are very excited. We're going to have a guest come on and we're going to talk about three films of lesbian cinema or that our guest considers part of lesbian cinema. That would be The Original Nightmare Alley with Tyrone Power, Scarlet Empress, and A Walk and uh, walk on the wild side. So I'm very excited about that. Very excited to have a guest on and to get their point of view and all that stuff would be a lot of fun. And then I am very excited in July. And yes, I know for people who realize why we're doing this, June would probably be better. Get over it. We can't. In July, we're going to be talking about the Before Trilogy with Yay! with uh, by Richard Linkletter and... Uh, Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke. Um, very excited, very, very, very excited, and we're sure we'll get into that when we do the episode. But very excited to get into that, and it's a timely time to do that, as we will explain when we get to that episode. But in the meantime, you can check out our kind of hosting site, 25 years later site.com, at its website. Um, you can also check out its uh, Twitter account at 25YL Media. I do believe the the name of the website will be changing sometime in the next little while, possibly by the time this comes out, hopefully not. But eventually that will be changing because they're rebranding. But as of right now, those are the names of all those things. And you can also check out, if you're not listening to this on my YouTube channel where I'm posting these now, um, you can find links to my YouTube channel on my Twitter account, at Cinema Pack Rat. And you can find me on Twitter at Rosalie Lewis. You can also find my writing on fthismovie.com. 
And I recently did a podcast there. And sometime in the near future, I'm also on the Schlock and Awe podcast hosted by Lindsay Wilkins. I don't know when that episode is coming out, but it's a fun one. So until next time where we talk about some Pedro Almodovar movies, why don't you check out some Brendan Fraser and have some fun. And we will see you next month. So you know a lot is got can't be beat well But he goes and turns up the heat So we can see him fly by with that big shirt Don't forget to shout Hey, Mr. Zeus, Zeus